All right, well, I encourage you this morning, if you have a Bible with you, if you'd like to open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And so uh, as I was thinking and praying about Mother's Day, I was thinking, well, what passage can I go to to really kind of talk about uh, kind of mothers and encourage mothers? And I landed on uh, this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 1 that speaks about Hannah. And, uh, and so just a little bit about it. Um, you know, Hannah was this lady that she was barren. She had no children. And uh, because she had no children, she was in deep despair. And out of this deep despair and sorrow that she had, she prayed this prayer. And uh, from this prayer, Samuel comes about. Samuel comes about at this great priest and prophet in the Old Testament. And uh, that was the fruit of a mom's prayers. And when I think about just Mother's Day in general this morning, I think about uh, just, just mothers and their fruitful prayers. And I tend to think that, you know, mothers, and, and I'm generally speaking, and not in all cases, but uh, mothers' prayers are more fruitful than any other prayers, I think, uh, you know, in the family. And, uh, and I believe that because that's how God has really designed mothers in general to really care you know, for their children, you know, even more than fathers. And I'm generally speaking, you know, fathers, we, we love our children. We care, we pray for our children. But I, I think that this is the way that God has wired mothers. And uh, I know my wife's prayers, I mean, she just outprays me <laughs> in a lot of different, I mean, she's just, you know, she's gifted in that way. And so, uh, but I just wonder, you know, this side of heaven, I don't think we'll see the fruit of our mother's prayers. I know I'm the fruit of my mother's prayers. Uh, out of my, my, my background, my mom and dad, I would venture to say my dad has probably never prayed for me. Uh, but my mom, she's probably always prayed for me. And so I'm probably standing up here on the stage because my mother prayed, prayed for me all these years. I would venture to say, we'll never see this side of heaven you know, the fruit of our mother's prayers. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of like prodigal children that have like gone in the, gone astray out in the world, but they come back to church, they come back to the Lord because of the, the mother's prayers. Uh, like I mentioned, I don't, I don't think we'll see it this side of heaven, but I think once we get to heaven, we'll see, wow, look at these people, look at these children that are up here because of the fruit of our mother's prayers. And so, uh, so we're going to look at that this morning. All of us are the fruit of someone's prayers. You're here this morning because somebody prayed for you. I could promise you that. I prayed for you. I prayed for you this week. I prayed for you this morning. And so uh, somebody is praying over you. I could promise you that. And so, uh, so let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, uh, the verses will be up on the screen here. And so let me kind of get, just give you a little bit of context, historical context. Back in uh, 1 Samuel, of course, we're, we're in the Old Testament. Uh, and so we can't apply everything directly, historically, to our lives personally. But we can always draw a personal application out of everything in the Old Testament. And so, uh, but you have to be careful and understand, it is the Old Testament. We're New Testament believers. And so in the context right here, as I mentioned before, there's this man, his name is Alcana, and uh, he had two wives. Now, now again, we're in the Old Testament. Uh, this is something that, you know, they allowed back in the culture back then. This is not something that God approved of, I don't believe. And you have to understand everything the Bible reports to God didn't necessarily approve of. And so God's design for, for a, a marriage was always one man, one woman. From the very beginning, you see that in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus speaks of it in the Gospels. Paul speaks of it in the New Testament too. So, but that's the case in this situation. This man, he had two wives. One wife, uh, her name was uh, Penina, and she was fruitful. She had many children uh, from her husband. But Hannah, God had closed up her womb. She had no children. And, uh, and so that was big back in, the, I mean, it's big these days, but it was even, you know, uh, you know, even bigger back in those days. And so, and because of that, she prayed in her deep sorrow because she had no fruit. And so let's go ahead and pick it up at verse 10 in 1 Samuel 1. It says, and she was in the bitterness of her soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. 
Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. So she, it becomes a prayer that comes out of her in her deep bitterness and anguish here, and she makes a promise to God. That if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. And she made that promise to God. Now again, back in those days, I mean, to have a family lineage to pass on the family name, I mean, that was huge. And uh, I know it's an, uh, there's a lot of families that, you know, where wives can't have children, and that's huge in families today too. But it was even more so back then. And then verse number 12. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. That was, the, that was the priest. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So she was praying out of anguish and, and nothing was coming out of her mouth, but she was praying in her heart to the Lord, which kind of shows where you know, what prayer is really all about. It's not, you know, the necessarily words coming out of your mouth. It's what is coming out of your heart. It's communication from your heart to God. That's what true prayer is. And that's what Hannah was doing. I mean, it, the prayer was coming out of her heart. And Eli, the priest, he thought she was drunk, you know, just, you know, just, you know, kind of just blabbering, you know, or, or whatever. And so jumping down to verse 17, uh, it says in verse 17, Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. So, so she explains to him, I am not drunk. I am in deep sorrow, and I'm, I'm praying to the Lord. And, and so, so Eli, he discerns that this was true, and, uh, and he prays for her. And he prays that God grants her petition. And then verse 18, uh, and she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So after that, she, she basically asked the priest, would you continue to pray for me? I mean, that's what her request was right there. Continue to intercede before God for me. And, and through that, she gets up from prayer, and now she was lo no longer sad. I mean, that's what prayer should do in our heart, in our life. It should make us like healthier and happier after we're done with prayer. And then verse number 19, then they arose early in the morning of worship before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah uh, knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. And that's literally what Samuel's name means. It, it means heard of the Lord. I mean, Samuel came about through a prayer from Hannah out of her deep sorrow. And, and then it goes down in the, at the end of the chapter, and it says, verse 27, for this child I prayed, and the Lord granted me my petition, which I have asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. Lent means she gave him back to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent or given back to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. So Hannah, she keeps that promise and she gives Samuel back to the Lord. And he becomes the greatest prophet and priest of the Old Testament, of all Israel. And, uh, and that's the fruit of a mother's prayers. And again, I believe all of us is the fruit of somebody's prayers. You know, when someone comes to salvation, you know, it's not only when someone shares their faith with them, which is really important to share your faith, you know, with someone else to where they understand the gospel. They understand about their sin. They understand what Christ did for them. They understand all of that stuff about the gospel. But it's when somebody prays behind the scenes, that's when God actually works. That's when actually in their heart, they understand, wow, I do realize I'm separated from God. I do understand what Christ did for me. Without that praying behind the scenes, really nothing happens. Because as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, you know, we sow the seeds, but God gives the increase. 
God gives the increase. The Holy Spirit works in a person's heart and brings about change and transformation and things like that. You know, we fight the spiritual warfare through prayer. I don't know if you realize that. I mean, it's not, some people just think, well, I'll just try harder, right? I'll try harder and harder and harder, and then I'll win the battle. Or I'll just get mentally stronger and stronger and stronger, you know, then I'll win the battle. Or I'll just, I'll do more and more and more, then I'll win the battle. You know, that's what some people think. Some believers think that. The only problem with that thinking and that mentality is, is that it's all about what you do. You know, it's all about what, you, what you're going to do in the spiritual battle and not about what God's going to do. You know, really, it's God that wins the battle for us. It's not us. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't do anything. We should do things that, you know, everything that God wants us to do. But it's actually God at work behind the scenes that actually wins the spiritual battles in our life. That's how it happens. You know, I think a great example of this is David back in the Old Testament when he fought Goliath. You know, when David fought Goliath, he was out everything. You know, I mean, Goliath had a bigger weapon. He had a bigger sword. Goliath was, was you know, bigger. He had more experience in warfare. Everything. I mean, I mean David, he, he had a, it was like a snowball's chance in hell, as they say, you know, that he was going to win. And so, but this is what David says about that battle here and later on in, in 1 Samuel. He says, he says this in, uh, or do we have that passage? We don't have that passage. Okay, let me, uh, I have that passage. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47. He says this, Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So David says here, the battle is not going to be won because Goliath has the, the bigger spear and the bigger sword. No, that's not how the battle is going to be won. The battle is the Lord's. He is going to defeat you today. See, David, he didn't rely upon just because he was a little shepherd boy. He didn't rely upon because he had a good technique, you know, with the sling and, and he was going to sling that stone to the right. He didn't rely upon that. He knew that God was actually going to defeat that. He was going to guide that stone right, at, right straight in the forehead of that giant and he was going to take him down. And that's how he, he, he trusted in that. You know, God is the one that fights our battles behind the scenes in our life. He, he is the one. And through our prayers, that's, that's why when it, it comes down to prayer, you know, that's what, that's what defeats the enemy. Offensive prayers and defensive prayers. Just like if you're in wartime, you need an offense and you need a defense. We need an offense in our prayers. You know, I quite often pray that God will bring down the strongholds in somebody's life. That's an offensive prayer. Bring down those strongholds. Let them see their need for a Savior. You know, let them get victory and freedom. That's offensive prayer. We should pray defensive prayers like protect us. You know, protect us. Be, your, be our fortress in this situation. Be our strong tower. I mean, that's defensive prayers. You know, we should have both sides. I mean, prayer is how we defeat our spiritual enemy. It really is, and we have to understand that and realize that. And I think as we look at our passage, I think we see some ways how we, 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 our prayers become fruitful in our life. The first thing that I want to show you is that uh, we need to pray with fervency. Pray with fervency, because in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10, it says that, And she was in the bitterness of her soul. And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. I mean, she was just in deep sorrow. God, you haven't, you closed up my womb. You haven't blessed me with a child. Here the, this other wife is. She has all kinds of children. I have nobody. And she was just weeping and it turned into a prayer. And just weeping, just praying fervent. God, bless me with a son and I will give him back to you. You know, I believe that when we pray fervently, that's when our prayers become fruitful. A lot of times we don't pray fervently, and it's for different reasons. Some, sometimes we feel like, well, everything's okay in my life. I'm good. My kids are good. I got my job, and, you know, I got my health. 
Everything's good in my life, so I really don't need to pray. So we really don't pray fervently. Sometimes we don't believe that, that prayer really works, right? I mean, we tried it. I prayed before. Nothing happened. So why pray? And, and sometimes it's, we don't pray fervently because of that. So sometimes we, we, don't, we don't pray fervently because we think that God really doesn't care. God doesn't really care to know my specific situation and hear the details of my life. And God is this far away God way up there and I'm way down here and he's just kind of left me to myself. And, and sometimes we feel like that and so we don't pray fervently. But in actuality, God wants us to pray fervently. And when we, when we pray with that fervency, then it's like it gets God's attention. You know, when we pray like in, out of the, our sorrow, it gets God's attention. And so, you know, I love what James says about this. In James chapter 5, verse number 16, this is what James says about it. It says, to confess your trespasses one to another, uh, trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. So as we, as we interact in our relationships and we, when we have that transparency and vulnerability, then we realize, man, I need to pray for you. You have struggles in that area. And, and so that's when we, 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 have, we confess to one another so that we can be healed. And then he says in the last sentence, the effective fer fervent prayer of a righteous man, or I would say, and woman, avails much. So the, those two words, effective, fervent, actually the, the root Greek word is a Greek word, uh, is where we get our, our uh, English word called energy. It's like energio is the Greek word. And so that's where we get our English word energy. And so when, when our prayers have emotional and spiritual and mental energy in them, that's when he says, that's when it avails much. That's when, when we have fervency in our prayers. You know, that's when it gets God's attention. You know, I wonder a lot of times if God is, is up in heaven and he's just thinking, do you really care what you're praying for? I mean, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, you're, you're not that passionate about that person's soul or you're not that passionate about getting victory or freedom in your life or you, what it, whatever it is. God is wondering, do you really care about what you're praying for? You know, I think we should, I think we should seek God and pray fervently, uh, kind of like what, what I experienced uh, on, our, on our vacation just here recently. Last week, we, uh, we got to go down to Cos Cosmel, Mexico, and, uh, and enjoy ourselves down there and relax. And one of the days, we went out to the square in Cosmel, and they had these different vendors around the square where you can have these shops and buy different things. And, and so we walk up to one vendor and I'm looking at, they had some sunglasses out there. And I ask, uh, you know, how much are your sunglasses? And, uh, and he was like $15. And so I'm trying them on. And what do you think? What do you think, Lisa? And, and, uh, and how much again? And they're like, $13. I'm like, whoa, they went on sale pretty quick. And <laughs> 15 to 13 and uh, so I thought, well, let me ask you, what's your bottom dollar? Well, okay, $12, you know. And uh, so the guy, he takes me, he knows that, you know, I'm looking at, his, they actually had some cheap stuff. And so he's like, oh, yeah, you like cheese? And he brought me inside his shop there, and he showed me all these things he's, he has. And, and he, and he uh, shows me this little wooden thing that has this painting of chiefs on it. And, and so he's willing to deal with that. And he shows me this hat this hat with Cosmel and Chiefs on it, and I ended up buying all kinds of stuff in there. I, I had to, like, fight to get out of there. You know, I'm done, I'm done, you know. And, uh, and, and so, uh, but I think about that when it comes to prayer, and, you know, do we approach God like that? I think we should approach God like that. When we pray for things fervently, it's like, God, will you do this in my life? Will you do this in this person's life that I love? And then, you know, we come back to God in prayer, and it's not done yet. God, will you do this in my life? And, you know, do we get a hold of God and not let him go until he actually answers our prayers? And I'm not suggesting that, because sometimes God says no in prayer, or he says not yet. 
And I'm not suggesting that, you know, we shouldn't listen to God in prayer because, you know, prayer is about listening to God as well. But, but sometimes God is just waiting for us to, like, pray fervently and get passionate about what we're praying for and really care about what we're praying for. You know, I think that's, that's the reason why it's important to have, uh, like, a quiet time in your life. I don't know if you have that established in your life yet. Uh, I mean, I, I pray, like I prayed on the way to church this morning. You know, I pray everywhere I go, whatever I'm doing. But I think a quiet time is important in this regard uh, because when you have a quiet time, you get away from all the distractions, all, you know, people and, you know, put, a, put away your cell phone, everything, and you just pray before God. You listen to God. And you're able to pray fervently before him and, and talk about the issues of your life or things going on in your life or other people. And that's your time to really pray fervently, you know, for things. You know, when we pray fervently, our prayers become fruitful. fruitful. And then secondly, we need to pray for, uh, for, uh, with eternal purpose. Because you see this in uh, verse 11 when, when it says, Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him back, give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. The razor ha has to do with the, the vow of a Nazarite back in the Old Testament uh, and they would do these different things to show that they were like dedicated to the Lord, consecrated to the Lord. And, and this child, Samuel, he would be, she would give him back to the Lord. Now, I, I wonder if God just gave her a son originally, if her prayer would not have been like this. If her son wouldn't have been for her and not dedicated back to the Lord. I just wonder. But now, this son God, he's yours. This is for your eternal purpose. I give him back to you. And God heard that prayer, and he, and he granted her request. You know, I, God wants us to pray for things that we have in our life. You know, I, I'm not saying he doesn't want us to do that. We all have needs in our life. We all have wants in our life. God wants us to pray for those things. I mean, that, that's how we connect with God. God, I need this. This is going on in my life. Or, you know, I want this. You know, he wants to bless us with our, our you know, he promises to bless us with our needs, but also he wants to give us our wants as well. He wants to bless our life. But sometimes I think those prayers kind of fog up, you know, the, the, the eternal purpose in our prayers. You know, I think sometimes God is, you know, he, he's saying something like this. Yeah, I see you need that. And I see you want that. That's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. But what about your neighbor that doesn't have eternal hope? What about them? What about your friend that needs freedom in their life? And, you know, they're, they're just in this deep bondage and they can't serve God. They can't follow God because of this bondage. What about them? Will you pray for them? What, what about your children that, that they're in this addiction addictive behavior, or they're in this bondage in their life, what, whatever the case may be, what about those people? What about the eternal things that I want you to pray for? Now, I wonder if God is just wondering when we're going to pray for those things, because those are the things that really get God's attention. Again, God wants us to pray for all the other needs and wants, but it is the eternal things that really get God, gets God's attention. You know, I, I love what this passage you know, says about this in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 5, in verse 14, he says, there's a promise right here. He says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we get the, the genie out, right? We rub, rub the genie out. Give me my wishes. God, let me win the lottery, right? Let me have this new house that I want, right? No, I'm, I'm only kidding. Maybe it's God's will for you to, to win the lottery. I don't know. But that's not what the passage is talking about. 
He, he says anything according to his will. You know, God's will is not a mystery to us. God's will is revealed in his word. He wants us to know his will. And so, and that way we can pray according to his will. When we pray according, sometimes when I pray, I like attach a verse to the prayer. God, this is what your word says, and I'm just going to pray that it happens. I'm going to pray that this happens in this person's life. This is according to your will. Those are the prayers that, that are fruitful, that gets God's attention. When we pray like that, he says, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. See, a lot of times God is just waiting for us to like pray for someone's soul, the salvation of someone's soul. Or pray for like your children and deliverance in their life, this whatever, this bondage that they have in their life. Or maybe some healing that needs to happen in your own heart. Maybe you're kind of in bondage in your own heart and you have an unforgiving heart or you have something going on in your life and you need to pray for your own healing. And God wants you, that's, that's eternal. That's an eternal purpose. You know, I mean, God wants us to pray for those things. And when we pray for those things, then our prayers become fruitful. They become powerful. And then lastly, we need to pray with peace. We need to pray with peace because it says in verse 17, then Eli answered and said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. You see what happened right there? Eli, he, he prayed for her, but then she walks away, and her face was no longer sad. She didn't have her son yet, but she found joy, and she was healthier and happier as she walked away from prayer even though her, her prayers were not granted yet. You know, I think it should be like that. When we pray, we should, we should walk away healthier and happier for pr just, you know, from praying. Even, even if God doesn't grant our request yet, I mean, it should give us peace, you know, in our heart. You know, there's a lot of things that burden us down in life. I mean, sometimes it's like, you know, the separation of a loved one. You know, it might be the death of a loved one, you know. And I, I don't want to mention that, you know, this, this morning for our mothers, you know. Uh, a lot of times Mother's Day is kind of difficult because of children, you know, that are maybe no longer here or separated, whatever the case may be. That is a heavy burden, you know, when you, when you lose someone in your life. Sometimes, you know, it's just a deep hurt and pain in your life. You know, that, that's a heavy weight, you know, to carry around. You know, sometimes it's just, Whatever, what, whatever, whatever the issue is, it becomes a heavy burden in your life. And it's hard to rise up, you know, and, and, and just from that. It's a, heavy, it's a heavy burden. And I think it's a lot like, you know, again, what, something I experienced on, my, on our uh, trip that we went on. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to go scuba diving on our trip. And if you know anything, anything about scuba diving, uh, the word buoyancy is a very important word when you're scuba diving. It basically means that you can float, which is important when you're scuba diving. And so, and so what you do when you scuba dive, you put this weight belt on, and you put this BC on, you go down in the water, and you inflate the BC, and, uh, and so you want to become negatively buoyant to where you sink down in the water, but then you want to become neutrally buoyant so you can kind of float around and, and see things you want to see. But then you want to become positively buoyant also so you can come back, rise back up to the surface. Okay, so all that stuff is really important. I, I remember on the boat that we was on, this one guy, he actually became my dive partner. Uh, I think his name was Franse. He was from the Netherlands. And, uh, and he didn't take his weight belt off. We took everything else. He didn't take his weight belt off when he was on the boat. And the dive master was like, Take that weight belt off. Take that off. And he said, if you fall over, you can just, you're going to sink like a rock in the water. And, uh, and so uh, it made me just kind of think about this point. I think a lot of people are just like, they're burdened down with things in life. And they don't, be, they don't know how to become, you know, like buoyant, positively buoyant in their life. And, and, and so they got this weight of all these things in their life, and they just kind of jump off the boat. 
you know, into life. And it's like they just like sink down to the bottom in despair. And they, they don't know how to rise up to the top. They don't know how to become positively buoyant. And that's exactly what prayer should do in our life. Prayer should make us positively buoyant, come up, and it makes us healthier and happier in our life. It should give us a peace. You know, I love what this passage uh, in Philippians says about this, Philippians 4. He says, uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he says, be anxious for nothing. You know, that's a, that's a big thing in our society now. There's anxiety is a big struggle with a lot of people and panic attacks and things like that. I mean, we've seen that in our family. And, um, and you know, sometimes it's more than prayer, but a lot of times there's, there's something broken right here when it comes to prayer in a lot of people's lives. Because prayer should relieve anxiety. It, it, it should relieve that, is what it's saying right here. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. See, that's important. God, I just, I just want to give you thanks ahead of time for what you're doing, what you're going to do. Whether or not you grant my request, Lord, I want to give you thanks. I want to praise you. We should give him thanksgiving. Just let our request be made known. Verse 7, the peace of God. That's that supernatural peace that comes into our heart that, I mean, hey, God, I'm good with whatever it is. Wh whatever it is happens from this point forward, I'm good, God, because I have your peace in this situation. You know, we need that. We should pray, you know, with peace. 